guys, very exciting video today. We're gonna talk about what every trader, that is every self-respecting trader, should be considering when taking the next trade. And that is officially the historic analog. Guys, one of my favorite videos of all times is what I'm gonna show you today. Now, I've watched it hundreds of times, and there's some really incredible lessons to be learned from this particular trading video of arguably the greatest trader of all times. But in today's particular discussion, I wanted to bring a little bit more light to what is actually historic analog. And as you're watching this documentary I'm about to show you, okay, make sure you look at it from the context of the historic analog. Now, for those of you that are 13 Market Moves daily subscribers, we actually revealed on multiple occasions certain instances in the history where we have pointed out set of events on the chart that resemble a particular environment which we took advantage of either on the bull side or the bear side. Now, the historic analog, the way we look at it, we look at ton and ton of instances in the history specifically analyzing the charts and the chart patterns which could actually point out to what is coming next if certain conditions are met. Now, the second thing we take a look at when we look at historic analogs is the actual macro environment. So when you combine the charts, the chart patterns, the macro environment, and guess what else? Yes, of course, the 13 markets move formula. You get a winning combination, and this is how exactly we're able to predict the drop in the market last year, the drop in the Bitcoin in 2017, the drop in a lot of things over the last few years. We also use the same strategy combining all those things in nailing when the markets were hitting all-time highs in December 2017 and January 2018. And also we've used the same thing to predict the markets were going to hit 3,000 on S&P just recently, literally last couple of weeks. So if you're wondering what is the historic analog, this documentary is going to show you that even though this historic analogs sometimes are insanely precise. There are actually going to be days when these historic analogies are not going to be 100% perfectly aligned. We've actually shown you a video on this channel about analyzing the historic analog we've just recently been using and applying it to current market conditions. And those that have followed it on Thursday have definitely taken the rewards of the markets moving higher. Now, Friday, the market should have continued to move higher, but it didn't. And as you're watching this documentary, okay, pay very close attention how the greatest trader of all times actually goes through the historic analog. Now, he knew that utilizing the historic analog dating from 1928, 1929, he was going to layer over in 1986, 1987 and he was actually timing the crash, which is exactly what we are doing right now. However, there were multiple things on this historic analog, which he was analyzing, that predicted the market was initially gonna move higher before the bigger drop. So this is exactly the circumstances that we're observing right now. And even though people are getting incredibly bearish, this bigger move in the market is still very much in place, despite of a temporary hiccup in the historic analog yesterday on Friday. So hopefully this documentary is gonna clear a lot of questions. You can see that even the best traders in the world utilizing the historic analogs on certain days, it could be off, particularly when he loses five million bucks on just one day trading in 1986. Now, eventually, it results in him accurately predicting the future move higher and he makes all the money back plus a ton more. So if you're wondering who is this, crazy secret trader that I'm talking to you about. It's actually Paul Tudor Jones. I respect him very much. If you guys can find any information on him, he is definitely the best trader out there and we can all learn from him. So in this historic documentary, if you've watched it before, guys, challenge yourself and watch it again because every time I watch this thing, I find something new, okay? And for those of you that are brand new, you're trying to learn charts, uh, divergences, you're trying to understand what is the 13 markets move formula? How do we identify these historic things throughout the history in order to lay them over to the current market conditions? Guys, click the links below, check out our charts, patterns, and divergences course, check out the 13 markets move formula course so you can become the best trader you can be this year. So with that said, just keep in mind that historic analogs 
help you win the war. Your war between you and the stock market trading long term. That does not mean that the historic analogs is going to allow you to win every battle. But if you have a longer term mind frame on beating the market longer term with your trading career, then definitely watch this video for the very end. Grab a pen and paper, write some of these things down. And again, pay very close attention to the historic analog and how it's being utilized in order to nail these daily market moves. Enjoy your weekend. I will catch you on the next trade soon. Yes, there will be some type of a decline without a question in the next 10, 20 months. And it will be uh, earth shaking. It will be saber rattling and it'll have Wall Street in a tizzy and it will create headlines that will be, uh, that will dwarf anything that's happened at this point in time. to go and I'm getting ready to give them a little drums along the mohawk do a little tom timing on the market here on the end over 3,070 about this guy he wakes up at like four o'clock in the morning and trades like gold in hong kong and all sorts of places i mean if i woke up at four o'clock in the morning my wife would say you know get back to bed this is ridiculous yeah i'll tell you what i'll do uh I'll, you own 540 you own 540 only 540 I'm selling D-Marks. You own 540. He really loves it. And it involves sort of the use of all his energy, all his power, all his knowledge and everything. He puts it together into one incredible life. If I make the mark that I want to make, uh, I'll stop. I'll retire, uh, hopefully, a champion. Tudor Jones is a futures trader. He speculates on the future value of almost anything. It's been called an art, a science, a gambling game. It's a high-risk game for high rewards in an arena that is increasingly under scrutiny. Recent scandals have brought the Wall Street community into the glare of public and media attention, and the regulatory agencies are questioning the very existence of a certain kind of trading, stock index futures, at which Paul Jones has recently been one of the most successful players in America. It is March 1987, the third month of one of the most dramatic rises in the history of the stock market, and Paul Jones is taking a holiday. Well, sort of a holiday. When I originally decided to come here, it was going to be vacation, get away from everything. And then, as it turned out, uh, I can't, a number of the clients that I have uh, are, here in, are here in Europe, and most of them are here in Gestalt, as it turns out. So I've done an enormous amount of business. I've been in Paris, I've been in Geneva. So I kind of combine business with pleasure. I wish it had been more pleasure, but it, I still wouldn't trade for anything in the world. The most, you know, I always think of, I mean, if life ever ceased to be an educational experience, then I probably, I probably wouldn't get out of bed. This morning, Paul got out of bed at the Palace, one of the most elegant hotels in the world. The lifestyle in Stad is incredible because the, the people that I've met here and the people that I deal with, most of them are my clients. They pay me to allow them to enjoy this lifestyle, which is wonderful because I enjoy uh, working. 
I had a friend that I played backgammon with in college all the time. We were having uh, barbecued ribs for lunch during my second semester senior year in college. And he said, and I've always liked backgammon, chess, those type of games. And he said, if you think those are fun, if you really enjoy that type of stimulation, then then uh, he said, I'll, I'll show you a game that, that is the most exciting, the most challenging of all. Paul's company, Tudor Investment Corporation, manages other people's money. The firm has about 300 clients and has been rated top performer in its field for two consecutive years. Paul is the oldest one in the office. He's 32. His chief economist, statistician, and right-hand man, Peter Borish, is 27. We're making history today. This is the market. Futures trading is a young game. Just everyone jumped in. You know there's a way. You know how you know there's a way to check. As firms go, Tudor is small. It has only 22 employees and manages 125 million dollars, which isn't so much on Wall Street. But the team, for the time being anyway, likes it that way. They see their firm as a small, fast boat on a large, rough sea. What I love about it is. I'm doing my work, I'm doing my analysis, and I'm being, I'm graded instantly, and through the harshest teacher in the world, is the mark, there's no curve. You know, I can't say that, boy, I was out late last night, and everybody else in the class was at a pep rally for the football game, and I only got a 70, but that was the highest in the class, so I still get an A. It doesn't work that way in the market. It's an intellectual challenge, and it's, it, that's what makes it so exciting. Every day is something new, and every day is providing new information. Every day, every hour. Paul buys and sells futures in cotton, oil, dollars, Deutschmarks, bonds, precious metals, anything he thinks can turn a profit. Every rumor, every news item can be a warning or an opportunity. For example, this morning, the wires say OPEC is on the verge of a new agreement. OPEC has basically come to an agreement whereby they're going to have a 7% production cut. And my whole feeling is, is that any time that you try to get 13 people to agree to anything and I have a chance to take a position on it, well, they're going to have to, you know, wild horses couldn't keep me from, from betting against them succeeding in that. I'm selling, I'm selling the equivalent of about uh, four tankers on the opening. You've heard nothing else on OPAC? No. I got you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. What do you think of it, JJ? Is this a spot to nail it? I'd rather sell it down, though, than sell it Betting that the agreement won't hold, Paul is selling oil futures as fast as he can, hoping that the other traders won't see what he's up to. Speed is everything. It's 40 bit and a half. Offer 1,000. Offer, offer 1,500 and 40. Offer 1,500 and a half. Show the size. Ask him how much he sold. Give me a number. Tell him more behind it. Do it, do it, do it. There's more behind it. More behind it. I can feel it. They're going to get it. I'm going to get it. <laughs> Iraq who said something what does Iraq say that's a great that's great they have an agreement between 13 people but two of them said they won't agree which happened to be two of the five biggest producers in the world that was tough to figure out wasn't it <laughs> Paul is on the phone to an oil trader who's saying somebody's been selling a lot of oil but he doesn't know who that was my buddy at probably again the, the second or third largest crew trading firm and uh it's because, man, this guy, this guy, they sold the hell out of it. And the people that he worked with don't know that it was, which is great. That's even better. I hope they think it's some wild shit era. Who knows the whole agreement's getting ready to fall apart. Yeah. Even though Paul trades in every kind of commodity, his specialty is stock index futures, which are traded in pits at various commodity exchanges like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Merck, or the New York Futures Exchange, the Ninth. These people are betting not on a company or an industry, but on the future direction of the entire economy. And this week, just before Thanksgiving 1986, the big news is not good. The Iran-Contra affair has just broken, the insider trading scandal is heating up, and the market has been going nowhere. 85.90. In spite of the bad news, Paul and Peter are convinced that at any moment the market is going to soar. 
a half an hour to go. Because not only will we be selling, so will every, so will every other, uh, so will everybody else in the street. Yeah, yeah. Which means I want to get Paul. Paul. Yeah, I'm gonna do, do it again. Another three hundred. Sell them. Three minutes. Three minutes. Paul right, has bet a lot of money that the market is about to go up, but nothing is happening. If he's bet wrong, he's in trouble. The market goes down so much more faster than it goes up. It's it's incredible, right? It can take yeah. out two weeks of work in three hours. In fact, it took out six months of work in one day in September. We're going to get a big move one way or the other. And it's just right now trying to gauge which way that move is going to be. Everyone right now has to be negative walking in the morning, looking at the newspaper, looking at uh, the fact that the bonds are down, and yet this thing is maintaining an enormous premium to spot. All that stuff is sitting there looking at us every morning the headlines, and yet the market won't go down. It's telling a different story than the headlines are. What is happening again is that the the... The market continues to build energy, and every time you see these incredibly sharp downturns, all that's doing is, or to me, all that is is a signal of the fact that that people are absolutely skeptical, negative, and to a certain extent frightened through here, and yet the market won't break. It is screaming to me that it wants to go higher. At times like this, what gives these two confidence is a theory. It says the stock market moves in cycles, in patterns. And Paul and Peter subscribe to the Elliott Wave Theory, which says to them that what happened 49 years ago, in the late 1920s, is happening again, now. If the market is a reflection of people's behavior, and people behave uh, similarly in similar circumstances, then history of market prices may give us an indication of what may happen in, in the near future. But one of the last, the last great bull market really was the 1920s. And we looked back and did a statistical analysis on the 1920s through today, punching in literally thousands of Dow high, low, and closes to run correlations between what happened in 1925 and 1928 to what happened to 1982 and where we were in 1986. Well, that correlation turned out to be over 90%. In fact, since I've run that correlation, the correlation has gone up from about 90.7% to close to 92.2%. And as which, you can one see, is, which one is the 20s? The 20s is the blue, and the red is the 80s. So what day back in, in the 20s are we at right now, approximately? We're like in early August 1928. And so, let's see, if my memory serves me correctly, and we've got uh, another 40% of the day on the upside. Correct. So we we're talking about yeah, about another year, a little over a year of moving it down. And and um, and then there, and then it looks like there might be some storm clouds in the horizon. To say the least. The, 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 the correlations here are phenomenal. That's incredible. That's, what were the chances of taking any two five year period in the stock market and getting that kind of correlation? What would you guesstimate off the top of your head? I mean, it's got to be astronomical. You're talking a thousand observations. I don't know, one in a thousand. It's it's really pretty scary. You know, if it looks like a duck and it acts like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's probably not a chicken. And uh, that's that's what's scaring me about the activity in the stock market right now. Some analysts disagree, but Paul Jones and Peter Burish are among those who think there's a crash coming and a big one. You're probably talking about something with incredible fireworks with. Um with unbelievable and unprecedented volatility and with moves that will leave people gasping, uh, it's going to be total rock and roll. The market should continue to rally into the first quarter of 1988. Uh, a rough projection would be somewhere around 3,200 on the Dow. And then in March, April of 1988, there's weakness. And at, the, at some point shortly thereafter, in a if you're going to hold me to a date, let's say the end of March, 1988, uh, the market then drops sharply and retraces, you know, 50% of this bull move from 770 to 3200 in a matter of a couple of months. The last guy that buys a share of stock when the Dow is at 3,000 or whatever number it is, 
he's buying it because of the fact he thinks it's going to 6000 because it's been reinforced in his mind over the past however number of months, years, or decades that the stocks can't go down. In one sentence, buy low and sell high. That means buying now, riding it out till the market goes to about 31, 3200. Don't wait for top tick. That's 1988. Severe drop, a little rebound. By 1991, the market is going to be under 500 on the Dow. The debt gets to the bottom of every the accumulation, and then the and then the uh, repayment of debt basically drives every economic cycle that there is. And right now, we have probably explored the envelope with regard to mortgaging our future earnings. The next Part of this cycle will be the repayment of what we've enjoyed now for the past four or five years. I mean, again, we're in the largest post-war business expansion uh, cycle in history. I'm, I'm concerned. And knock on wood, if we're successful here and the play comes about and we make a lot of money, I, I want to go work for the Treasury or work for the State Department or work for the Fed to help uh, out of this out of what I consider will be uh, dire economic consequences. Paul spends weekends at his farm in Virginia overlooking Chesapeake Bay. It is early Sunday evening, and but the only markets open at this hour are in New Zealand and soon in Hong Kong. So he gets on the speakerphone with some brokers and starts to trade currencies. At any hour, any day of the week, someone is trading money. And the price of the dollar is never still. It jumps and falls in little ticks every half minute or so. At this hour, most of the players are Japanese, Chinese, and Australian. What kind of size can you give me right now? Can you do me, can you do me 1100 1100 Yeah. 1100 contracts? Yeah, sixty million dollars. Can you do sixty million? No, that's a hundred and thirty-five million D mark. That's a bundle, isn't it? Yeah, you better put. Uh, you know, that's about uh, sixty-seven dollars. That's about seventy dollars. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do it. Hey, hold on a second. What a nice way for them to begin their morning. One thousand eighty contracts. I hope they never see daylight on them. Okay, that's a hundred and thirty-five million D mark. Here's the deal. Paul is betting that the dollar is about to go up. So as quickly as possible, he wants to sell a huge bundle of Deutschmarks he bought last Friday and buy dollars. I think that they'll be bidding it up as soon as they walk in, which will be 15 minutes, and that's why I'd really go and buy them right now. I'd like to go on and do business, but now these guys will make me a quote. They don't, want to, they don't want the exposure. They all think that we know something. Mm. Yeah, can you do me... Can we do it again? If you can give me 30, 45, I'll, I'll deal on that. I, I can't hear what you're saying, Paul. If you can give me 201, 30, 50, 45, I'll deal on that for the whole amount. Okay, well, let me see what they The price of currencies is a little hard to follow, but if Paul can sell his Deutschmarks at a quote that sounds like 30, 45, he figures he's getting a terrific bargain. I want a quote in 15 pips for the whole thing. Okay, stay with me. They all think that whenever someone from the States is coming in and dealing this early in the morning, that they know something. So they're very wary about doing business because they assume that we have some knowledge that they don't know about. Whereas an hour from now, the market's been open and they've had a chance to digest all the news items that, you know, and they've seen the direction of trading, the volume that's gone through, that they're not as nervous. But by that point in time, a dollar could be considerably higher than where it is now. That's why I went to business. No, I'm asking this one very good bank in Tokyo for the whole uh, wide. Yeah. Um, you know, I would like to break it up because I'll probably make it... Uh, when you take your initial position, you have no idea whether you're right or not. What's exciting is if it starts to go your way. Now, that's the reality. I'm asking these banks, uh, you know, for the whole amount. I know you wanted a one quote. I'd rather break it up. I mean, even if you have to sacrifice a little bit because they're going to check. Right. And you know what? I'll just call you back in 10 minutes. No, no, hang up. I'm asking okay. you. Maybe they're going to come back. Okay. Okay. Let me see what they say. You can always pull it back and then we can split it up. Okay. Wait a minute. Somebody's making me, I think. Okay. Because, I mean, after a while, the size means nothing. You know, it's just, again, it gets back to the question of whether you're making 100% rate of return on 
$10,000 or $100 million, it doesn't make any difference. All right? You know, if you're, if you're, if you complete 78% of your passes, it'd be nice if you're in the NFL, but if you're in college or high school or even elementary school, I'm sure the thrill is just as great. Okay, you still want to go after that time? Yeah, I do. We you show on your screen? If the quote rises over 50-60, Paul's plan is in trouble, and with every passing minute, it keeps rising. I should have been... 50-65. Oh, um, no, tell me forget it. That's bullshit. Nothing, huh? No, nothing. I'll call you back. I can't hear you, Gerard. Do you hear this? We started off as 35, 45, 45, 40, 50, 50, 60, now 60, 70. This is just pissing me off. Paul's choices are narrowing fast, so he lowers his sights and goes for a smaller deal. Yeah. 63, 70, 80, 100 contracts. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'll, you own 540. You own 540. Only 540. Paul settles for half the dollars he wants. I'm selling D-Marks. You own 540. Sometimes you'll find a cowboy who will say, okay, come on, I'll play. No problem. Take your best shot, which I was hoping would happen tonight. And then sometimes, and more often than not, you're better off calling up maybe three different houses and say, give, and, give me a quote for 50 million a piece. And then just going boom, boom, boom. And I probably should have done that. The people that I call a lot of times, again, like them, they like to be macho man. What they want to take the whole thing. And you know, this time, uh, in terms of execution, it was very poorly done. Trading requires an energy level, and it's very difficult to sustain it 24 hours a day, which is what this requires. So, uh, you know, this this lack of aggressiveness probably cost me a little bit. Even at the higher price, Paul made money. He eventually sold his dollars for a profit of $100,000. To do the job right requires, again, such an enormous amount of concentration that you've got to be able, it's, it's, it's physically and emotionally mandatory that you, know, that, that you find some time to, to relax. And you've got to be able to turn it off like that. There'll be times, though, when I get, so incredibly excited about a trade or even a project that I'll wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, there's no way in the hell I'm going back to sleep. I'll sit there and I'll trade in my dreams for four hours. Well, we've got to pay for another major calamity on Wall Street or in the White House because if we can... December 3rd, 1986. The market is about to close. Paul is on the phone from Chicago and Peter is at the helm. Yesterday, there was so much buying after the close that the tape was nine minutes late, and that was a 130 million share a day. I believe that today will be record volume, which matches perfectly with the analog to 1928 when there was record volume on the decline, and it did not take it out until the week, which corresponds to this week on the analog, right? Yeah, when the market exploded. I know, I think it's my Can I talk about the scenario on what happens as the Dow approaches 2000, given... Just days after we heard Peter and Paul forecast a major rise in the market based on their 1920 stock charts, it now seems to be happening. Okay, I'll be here until uh, about 7.30. Okay. All right, bye-bye. I'm speechless, to tell you the truth. There is nothing, well, there is nothing we can do. Now we have to let the market tell us. It's phenomenal. Record volume, advanced declines. So everybody all of a sudden is starting to turn bullish. This thing, to me, is not going to stop immediately. You just don't, you don't stop a train with a brick wall. It, even if there's a wall of selling, the train is going to go through that brick wall and take out a lot of bears. This morning we were trading over a million shares a minute. Yeah. And then what happened? They were caught short. 
and they got out in a huge exchange where I trade, they got out 30, 40 points uh, away from their uh, position. We were sitting there at New Haas, and everybody was just looking and see what was going on with the S&Ps, and we just sit there, and everyone was just nervous. They went, there were no bids and no offers. I mean, literally for 20, 30 seconds, we'd all just sit there and look at each other uh, because it was just an anxious time, and uh, it was just constantly moving. December 5th, two days later, and the energy is still building. I feel like it's already in the market, you know, in terms of just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Ten minutes to the opening bell. Paul is phoning friends and competitors trying to get a feel for the market. Charlie. Yes, sir. What do you think? Bonds and stocks. Bonds first. I'm very bullish. On bonds? I'm very bullish on both of them. My guess is that you're going to have to fool enough people to uh, you know, get some people short, get people out of their long positions, and you're going to have to do it by looking like shit for most of the day. Zach! Oh, Zach? What do you think? Well, I think that, uh, in the bond? Bonds and S&P, just do bonds first. Okay, well, you know, same thing I thought yesterday was a B wave, which it looked like it was. No matter how you cut it, the news today is bullish on stocks. Yeah, that's what. And, and the thing is, everyone's going to be watching bonds and euros, and that's going to be the trap. And I'm just thinking that, that this might be the perfect scenario for it to go today. All right, Joey's going to do his orders. And I'm gonna Mike Marinek, a pit trader, prepares his clerks to take some of Paul's orders. Yeah, okay. Do all those orders. I'm not going to worry about that. All right. All right, we'll do more. It's Friday. The Dow gets up this afternoon. No one in the world's going to sell this thing if it's if it's up ten bucks. Any, it, it, it crosses into positive territory. I think it's just a question of when they close it. The, 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 the bulls will be on the stampede all the way to the close. Half sixty. Ten twenty. Ten twenty lower. Hey, made by eighty. Hey, sixty seven. The one minute warning bell. What's that? Ten lower. Try to watch Dave. I'll try to watch these guys. Okay. Tell him uh, I want about 300 in the first two minutes, no matter what the price is. Ready. And yeah. 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 Okay. Paul is assuming that any second stock prices could shoot up. So he tells his traders to buy stock futures as quickly as possible before the price goes up. Answer oh the buy one market. Wait two minutes. Two minutes. Wait. Hey, I'll be buying even. Yes, There should be somebody there signaling that stuff to you. You shouldn't have to leave the phone. Do not leave the phone. You can be total. It's 70 but at least 200. Time to finish it up. Prices are starting to rise, and Paul is not finished buying. The longer this takes, the more it costs. Time to finish it up right now. Prices are still rising. Paul offers to sell some contracts to disguise the fact that he's buying anything to keep prices from rising so fast. Chicago prices at the same time he's trading in New York. 
Every bit of information could give him a critical advantage. Buy 300, now you're better right now. You can't even beat that. 90 for 300. Buy 390, buy 390. This is set up as a beautiful trim day. Look at this. I know. It's not even moving. We could be right That's where I'm thinking. That's where I want to run a couple of days from okay. this period because that's where we are. Let's look at the 1500. Too. Is that what you're looking at? Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. What do you got, Mark? Speak to me. 75 and 80. Well, it's Joey. Hello, Joey. What are we doing? We're, we're trying to buy 390, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now. Give me pills! Give me pills! In time, do not fuck around. I want to buy them. Okay. Quote me, quote me, quote me. What's the market? 90, 90, 90, 90. 90, 90 for 3,000. 90 for 3,000. Fill or kill? Fill or kill, Fill or kill, Fill or kill, Fill or kill, Fill or kill means do it now or don't do it at all. Fill or kill means do it now or don't do it at all. In just 10 minutes, Paul has acquired stock futures contracts worth approximately 80 to 90 million dollars. He is betting the market will keep going up. But 10 minutes later, it is slightly down. These tennis shoes, the future of this country, hang on. Because they've been good for a point rally in bonds. In about a $30 rally in stocks, every time I put them on, and I wait till I get the max, and then I put these suckers on. I bought these at a charity auction. They're Bruce Wells's. The man's stud. Pretty good. Right now, everything's on the lows. I hope. I hope he. I hope he, uh, in spirit, can do a little bit better than this, though. We'll find out. The business seems to attract people, often very driven by greed. Life expectancy. Yeah, I'm 32 years old right now, and I've been trading. Let's say since I was about 23. I've been physically on a trading floor for about seven years, since I was about 25. And uh, I hope I won't have to be here too much longer. I sort of have goals for myself in terms of an income that I'm trying to put some away in savings and get to a place where I can retire, so to speak. Um, realistically, I'm guessing another five, six years. Um, most people don't last too long in this business. Uh, I don't know of many older men or women in the business. There are some, but the floor trading game, which is a very high pressure, even physically demanding job with the voice, you can hear my voice, and the being pushed around, the being spit on, the being knocked out of the ring, getting into fights, all this kind of stuff. The sort of work expectancy is not too long. As I said before, people that would last 10 years, I think, have done an admirable job in terms of survival. Where can we put this, Sally? Can we put this 11 10 a.m. The market's been open an hour and 40 minutes, and still nothing is happening. This is what we need to reward every bear on Wall Street back into their dens. I think that's what we'll do. And the past two weeks, we've been playing as big as we've ever played before because, in fact, we think we know what's going on. Like right now, I'm watching the currencies, I'm watching crude, I'm watching stocks and bonds. They're all interrelated. You know, the whole world is simply nothing but a big flow chart for capital. And if I start getting hurt uh, in, for instance, stocks or bonds, then I'm going to make a total portfolio adjustment just because of the fact I might not like the way the numbers are going over the course of the day. I personally gone bankrupt, not declared bankruptcy, but lost everything I had. And had to borrow from friends three times in nine years that I've been in the business. Where I'd go sit in the park and just sit there and just go, I can't believe this. You know, this this is the end. This is the end of my life. Where you want to be is always in control, never wishing, always trading. And 
always, first and foremost, uh, protecting your ass. And that's why most people lose money as individual investors or as traders because of the fact they're not focusing on losing money. They need to focus on the money that they have at risk. How much capital is at risk in any single investment they have? If everyone spent 90% of their time on that, or the 90% of their time on pie-in-the-sky ideas about how much money they're going to make, then they'd be incredibly successful investors. 20, 30, 95 even, at 90. Jesus Christ. 12.20 p.m. The market has suddenly turned sharply down. What's he say? 90 offer. 80, 90. Even then, even a tag. Long count, long count, long count. Okay. These guys are, they're, they're Don't worry about it. Paul decides to cut his losses. Time to, time to cancel the buy and sell out whatever he just bought. Hi! 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 Sally? Hi. Paul Merritt, cancel the balance. Out. I got 350. You sell 300 and a half. 300 and a half. No, 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 no. Sell 300. Yeah, no, no, not you, not you. The phone in his hand connects Paul to the bond pit in Chicago, where bonds are also taking a beating. Another bad sign. Go, go, Paul. Time, go. Do it. The pressure to sell heats up. Time to do it. Move it. More, more, more behind it. Go, Paul. Time to offer it right now. Jam everybody. Jesus Christ. Hey, what do you got? We're out, Paul. We're out. Just time to do a total of 350. That's it. 2.30 p.m. Get Tony on, Sally. We got? Uh, it's uh, five, six, six, seven now. If it goes five, sell or sell a unit. Okay. That's, that's one order. If it goes five, sell or sell a unit. What do you got? All afternoon, the market has been dropping then pausing. Every pause brings hope for an upturn, but then it drops again. Go, Tony. Four minutes. Six, seven. That's just total devastation. You know, the, the agony and the ecstasy? This is what's known as the agony. 4.10 p.m. The stock market is closed. We're on the wrong side of the market. What can you say? Just, it's total devastation. We had a game plan. And, uh, yeah, we lost the battle. We haven't lost the war by any stretch of the match. Look, we just fumbled. We're, the, we're down 17 nothing. It's only the first half, and uh, we can score three touchdowns in the third quarter and take the game easily. Yeah, we're still up for the month. It's just it's just painful to give. Uh, when you got a good profit, it's really painful to give some stuff back. They cost me a lot today, and they're going to pay me 100% interest for this. They're going to pay 100 percent They, in this case, means the market. And today, they are the enemy. Well, did you have it to give? Well, I did too. So, to hell with it. That's part of the business. Well, all right, buddy. Take it easy. God, Zach had a 10% day. No. Yeah. You're kidding. No. I'm afraid to guess what ours is. So we lost 500 there. We lost, uh, and we lost. Well, I think we lost about uh, 5% today, which is one of the bigger hits we've ever taken. It's a drag. Five percent of Tudor Investments equals about six million dollars. Yeah,
Yeah. Well, you just take listening, right? And you hate, I mean, the money's irrelevant. Just the whole concept of having analysis that's so completely off the mark that um, you know it's a mental blow. It's uh, an intellectual blow, and you know it's part of the business. Who is it? I have, you'll have to get a message. I'll call him back. This is going to happen a thousand times in the next five years to me, so it's just something you want to live with. I hate it. Paul learned to handle the bad days 11 years ago in New Orleans. He got a job working for a commodities trader who taught Paul much of what he knows. I was a hell of a training ground. The first year I did nothing but get his coffee. I mean, I was learning by osmosis and stuff like that. But I was, uh, you know, I was, I was a glorified secretary, which is fine because I was soaking in everything, every, everything he did, every move that he made, uh, every step that he took. And I'll never forget Friday afternoon, three wives of three of his clients from Mississippi came into his office because he had the most beautiful office I've ever seen, period. Um, and everyone who wanted to come in and see his office, his art collection stuff. And he sat there right in the middle of getting absolutely decimated. Uh, across the board in these commodities and with the most beautiful smile on his face, the most incredibly elegant poise and stylish composure and just had a wonderful little chat with him for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And I just was overwhelmed that anybody could be that strong. <laughs> this is one of the few turkeys that thinks he's actually a dog. He was raised with a dog, and he thinks he's a dog. <laughs> he will follow you wherever you go. If you go inside the house, lie on the couch, he's going to come up and get on the couch with you. If you, if you get in the car, he's going to follow you in the car. If you get in the garden and start working, he's going to get in the garden with you. I don't know whether he thinks he's a, he's a dog, Joe, whether he thinks he's a... I, I think he thinks he's a human. You know, I guess it's the old game back to nature concept. Now, I bought this place because of that tree over there. That tree, in a very transitory world, has been here 300 years. It's the one thing of permanence. It's been here 300 years. It'll probably be here another 200 years, and I'll probably have come and gone. That house may have been burned down and something else put in this place. But it'll always be here. Paul was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. His father is an attorney, his mother a housewife. Well, I would leave school early when I wasn't supposed to. I would go by myself over to Arkansas and go on the backwaters of Mississippi where I shouldn't be, where no one should be by, by themselves, and I'd go duck hunting, which was just the greatest feeling of adventure because you knew that if you you knew that if you screwed up that you were out there all night and you probably weren't going to be coming back at all, and you knew if you caught that your parents were going to kick your butt and that uh, what you were doing was dumb and was foolish and all those types of things. But it was uh, it was just this it was this feeling of being you know, being somewhere 200 years ago. At the University of Virginia, Paul majored in economics. He became the campus welterweight boxing champion and was elected to every office in his fraternity. After college, he wasn't sure what to do, but following the trading job in New Orleans, he joined E.F. Hutton. And four years later, he became a vice president at the age of 25. Two years later, he quit, moved to another firm, quit again, and started Tudor Investments in 1983. His weekend home has 18 rooms and a staff of three. Paul lives there alone. I just donated that boat to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation because obviously being down here and watching the bay deteriorate as I have over four years, that has an impact on me. Um, and that hurts me because when I was a kid, all I did was hunt and fish. This year, I just decided that 10% of all the money that that we made as a firm was going to go to various charitable endeavors. Primarily, I have a dream. As part of the I Have a Dream project, Paul has joined with other businessmen to help disadvantaged kids stay in school. At least one night every week, he meets with some of the 85 kids in his group in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. He is pledged to pay the college tuition for every one of them who graduates from high school. We talked about from the first time that we've been talking. It dawned on me that what they really needed, they did not have, was an enormous amount of discipline and people to motivate them and people to push them. I had 
a kid over Christmas, 13 years old, got in a fight and with another kid who's 16, and he had a bullet put in his head at 13 years old. And that was when I stopped. That was when I decided that my role had to be one that was inter, that was that had a lot of interventionism, or there I was going to intervene in their lives as opposed to sitting back and commenting and asking them to do this. Instead, I was going to play a very active role in their life, and that is then the program has changed. Our program, which has changed to the point where we are now. Uh, imposing our value systems on those kids. And 75 is not going to cut it, right? And, we're gonna have, and what did I tell you if you made an 80 next time? That's right. My average is 80. 80? It's fantastic. It's great. It's super. Well, next time I'll report card, you got to bring it in so we can go over it. Being here, and particularly being in the business that I have, I have been in a position to reap enormous financial benefits. Uh, obviously, that's given me an enormous amount of power to do things that, that a lot of people can't do and to affect people's lives. And then it seems to me that incumbent with being a human being on this earth, that there is and there has to be some type of awareness of the rest of the people out there. There has to be an awareness of the fact that they need help just like I needed help 11 years ago when I didn't have a job and didn't have a clue as to what I wanted to do. And so all I'm doing is paying back, and the payback that I'm making is one that everyone owes. It's just a question of whether people accept the responsibility or own up to the responsibility and or the obligation. February 17, 1987. The stock market closes in 14 minutes. Based on the 1920 stock chart, Paul has bet against the herd that the Dow will take off today, and so far it has. Right now, Paul could cash in and make several million dollars. But if he holds on for a few minutes more, he could do better. He could also do worse. I want to sell it so bad I can't stand it. I've just been sitting here wanting to sell it all day, but I know the thing for me to do is just not to... Uh... Another thing for me to do is just to sit back. In fact, I shouldn't even be talking to you or look at the screen. I should just, I should try to go take, I should go work out right now. Yeah, I think that's what everybody else is doing, so. They also have 48 bucks with $3 off on all time record advance. And right now, I've got 10 kids in the back of the car just screaming to get out. Meaning that I'm so long, I am scared to death. Man, there's nothing but air about this thing. It's uh, 286.60. It's 10 ticks off its all-time high. And the Dow Jones right now is at an all-time high, 22.33, up 49 bucks. And we've got uh, 13 minutes to go. And I think it's going to go. I think we're going to have an all-time advance today, which will be exciting. Uh, get your Paul Davis, please. Sorry, stay there. 4 p.m. The stock market has closed. Up 54 points, an all-time high. Uh, excuse me, but is that a fifty-four dollar day in the Dow? Congratulations. I don't know how much we made today. It was a good day. It was. It was. It was over five million dollars. Conservatively speaking. It absolutely thrills us to death because that's what it was. Two months have passed since we saw Paul's fund take that $6 million loss. Right. Well, now you saw us get it back and then some. What you didn't see is what we did between then and now, which is uh, which was extract our 100% interest times about seven. The amazing thing was the analog had a closed time. Sweet. 41. Remember, I Even on a big win day... Paul is still nervous. The futures exchanges are open for another half hour, and Paul's instinct is to cash in to protect his winnings. Sure. All right, buddy, I'll get back to you. I think that's going to be it for the day. That's a wrap. Okay. Thank you. I tell you what, do this just in case I get crazy. Yeah. Sell a unit. I mean, sell two hundred eighty at uh, thirty at eighty-seven twenty-five. There'll be people selling. Just the easy right. trade is to yeah. sell, right? What are you doing? 
because when a market's a new high ground, it's never been there. It's gone up so far and so high and so fast. It's like, well, I want to sell it. How many did we sell? 250. Who bought them? Oh, I love it. If you just sell me on 30, I could have gotten those two. It's up a thousand points since we bought it. What's the point? You know, what's, what's the big deal of lightening up 5 or 10 percent? This way you can sleep at night. I wouldn't mind doing that. Of course, I can't sleep if I can't sleep. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's good for you. Know, the whole concept of the investment manager sitting up and making these incredible intellectual decisions about which way the market's going to go. Yeah, that, I don't want that guy managing my money because if he can be that dispassionate, then he's obviously uh, never ever, even to me, he doesn't have the competitive nature which is necessary to be a winner in this game. I want the guy who's not going to panic, who's not going to be overly emotionally involved, but who's going to hurt when he loses and when he wins, he's going to have a quiet confidence. But when he loses, he's got to hurt. Winning has another effect on these two. Even with Peter's 1920 stock chart, even with Paul's lucky sneakers, they're never sure of being right until they are. What's nice about winning is not winning, but what that means is that, is that not only have you done well to this point in time, but obviously whatever script you got, that you have written for the ensuing week, two weeks, two months, two years, obviously it's a script that has a great deal of weight behind it and the, and the market's corroborating it. So today's, today's gratifying, but what's exciting is the fact that we probably will know what's going to happen tomorrow and conceivably we know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks and months and years. And so you go home and sleep better when there's no uncertainty. And that's why today's good, not because of the money we made, but because of the fact we know where we are in the total economic landscape, or at least we think we do, and that maybe that's a maybe that's an illusion, maybe it's a false sense of security, but it allows you to sleep at night because we've done our work, and so far the market's corroborating. I'm still in awe of the fact that the way he purchased these contracts, I mean, he went out there, he made a commitment, and the commitment paid off. Not, you know, for all our clients. And knock on wood, you know, it'll continue. The one thing that I am absolutely certain of as a trader, and you're talking to someone right now who is incredibly long in the stock market, is that all of Wall Street right now, the investment community at large, basically is geared towards a Dow somewhere in the 2600 to 3200 range. And again, these are people that I think have track records that are impeccable. Let's assume that they are 100% wrong. If nothing else, there will be a point in time, unquestionably, when the market turns down, when all of them, when, when again, the investment community almost at once will say, this was, that may have been the top, or this was the top. And you're going to have all the people that are right now very comfortably invested, that are believing and, and feeding off the hope that the market will move higher, try to get out at the same time. When that happens, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the, uh, the famous Acapulco cliff dive. It's just a question of how fast before we hit the bottom. It is possible to make money when the market is going down as well as going up. And right now, Tudor Investments is preparing for a market collapse in 1988. If his timing is right, Paul's firm will survive, even get richer. But what's the lesson for the rest of us? First of all, you're talking about certainly six to eight years of pain. It's a horrible thought. It's not one that I hope happens, and I hope I lose my ass, and I hope the Dow Jones goes to 5,000 and sticks, but that's not what I think is going to happen. Um, and I, and it just won't be, uh, it, it'll be, it'll be just like if you have an injury, it takes a while to work yourself back into great shape, and I think the long-run benefits will be fantastic. I think the, the short run will be uh, unpleasant. It'll be painful, and there'll be uh, an enormous amount of, of, of general suffering for 
not just the U.S. populace, but the, but um, on a worldwide basis. From one hardcore bear to another, guys, you probably see me making a killing short in the stock market. But guys, there's time to be a bear and there's time to be a bull. Let me tell you a little story here. This bear right here is happy this morning. Do you know why? Because he knows the 13 market smooth formula that allowed him to buy the dip timely. And now this happy bear is making a killing. Now, this bear right here, guys, sad as hell. Look at this. It's actually a shame to all of us bears. Okay? Look what he's doing. This dude right here is drinking vodka and Red Bull. Shame to the bear club. But stuff like that happens, guys, because... They're traders, they're bears. They just want to short the hell out of this market, but their timing is off. So if you're trying to improve in this level, guys, stop trading alone. Out there, trading alone. Guys, that's a scary game. I mean, without the 13 markets move forward. I don't know how would any bear by himself, one man only standing, would be able to take on the entire market, entire wild stock market out there. So I want you to come trade with us using the 13 markets move formula style, which predicted the crash last year, which predicted the breakout in the markets to all time highs this year. Click the link below, turn yourself from a sad bear into a happy bear so that you can make your trading account great again. Great again. Do it now, damn it. from sad to happy, very easy. Click the links below right now.